Hi, I'm Patrick Pollan, CEO and founder of Favro, and this is the Learn From Leaders podcast. The background to this show is that Favro customers are some of the most innovative companies in the world. Enterprises wanting to be more agile, software as a service companies scaling fast, and game developers and publishers wanting to master live ops. So we get to know some truly inspiring leaders in product development, marketing, operations, sales, executive management. And what we do here is that we interview them about leadership so we can all learn from them. Let's go. And we are live with Brian. Um, and this is going to be super exciting because I know Brian for a very long time. And we're going to talk today about uh, five or more uh, things that you can do uh, when it comes to production to make um, things seem more more uh, productive, right? So, uh, Brian, uh, for the people that don't know you, um, I mean, can you tell the story? You know, the the your, your background. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I've been in game production for uh, I don't I don't want to date myself, but over twenty years now, and started with uh, electronic art. Uh, ran development for the Madden franchise for about five years and then oversaw portfolio management of the sports titles um, at EA Sports for another five. Moved into trying to make uh, mixed reality with Magic Leap for a few years, uh, then went down uh, down the road of more smaller indie studios, uh, working for Playful, uh, did some contract work with Hypixel Studios, and now actually out on my own doing some production with a bunch of other companies and trying to do some startups. So i um, really excited to be here because gaming is a huge passion of mine, obviously. I wouldn't stay in it for so long if it wasn't. Um, I've known Patrick for since the EA days, so I'm uh, inadvertently dating you now too. Uh, you're back on uh, some previous projects and things like that, and we've always had really had a good bond talking about different production methodologies and how the environment constantly changed within gaming and how some things all um always stay the same that's awesome and you know i would like to say that you're being very humble um I, you know i i think that when it comes to um uh, you know inserting good production methodologies you know in, in any kind of team you know uh you've been I mean, you've been doing this for like a l- many years, but at, at very various places, and and I think you're a bit of an authority uh, in the game industry uh, when it comes to like you know how how do we become more agile, you know? Um, and and you know I'm I'm a little bit biased because you know we have a new partnership uh, where uh, actually uh, favor clients uh, can benefit from your services, uh, you know, through our partner program. But uh, but that's not the topic for today. You know, today we want to talk about you know you know like how how do you uh, you know how do you get more productive? Um, and from your experience, you know, you must have seen some patterns of what teams typically are doing wrong and how they can do it better. Yeah, there's you know there. I always say it's like no matter the project, the similarities of the problems always come down to a few things that are consistent across um, the large titles that I've produced and the small ones. So, you know, at the end of the day, creative project is a creative project, whether it's small or large. Um, and a lot of it is really about addressing the mindset and really adjusting the expectations uh, going into the project before, uh, you know, at the onset to avoid the frustrations that are really typical, especially as teams, if I'm brought in uh, midway through a project, it a lot of the stuff could have been fixed or those problems shouldn't have happened if we adjusted a few things at the beginning and spent a little bit more time on the foundation. So um, there are a lot of consistencies. Obviously, every project has its own life and is is a little unique and you need to adjust for those. But um, I think, you know, there, there are some common things that you know, we can always work on from a production perspective and sort of set the stage correctly, at least to give ourselves a little bit higher chance of being successful. 
So if you would list, you know, like, well, we, we, we kind of said the five, right? Um, if you would like list, okay, like, a, like one, two, three, four, uh, you know, what would be the typical ones? Um, and, and, you know, you, you have some time here, you know, we, we, you know, it's, it's, um, you, you don't have to keep it like five minutes, you know, you can keep like five minutes to each of them. I think the, I, I would say the biggest one, at least one of the biggest ones that leads to a lot of frustration, especially with stakeholders later on when you're setting expectations or what people, you know, come to think about where the project should be at certain amounts of time, um, midway through production, et cetera, is setting the expectation that, you know, as much as you and I have been really trying to narrow down how to plan and do production better tools and frameworks and, and all that, and all that stuff really does help at the end of the day, everyone just needs, especially on creative projects and gaming need to understand that no matter how much time you spend on that plan up front, no matter how perfectly organized things are and all the I's dotted and T's are crossed, understand that it's still going to be wrong and accept that. It, you know, there are a lot of times I've worked with some more junior producers that get frustrated because they're like, well, this isn't going according to plan. And from my side, and I, I was like that when I was younger too, more, a little bit more experienced, but now it's like, well, yeah, it, it's not going to, this is a creative endeavor. It's sort of a living, breathing thing. Nobody can design and tell you right up front on a piece of paper, exactly what fun is going to be. Um, you have your best guesses. You have your best instincts and experience that you can bring to it. But from a production perspective, we need to make sure that we keep in mind that while we do need to spend time and understand and put our best foot forward from a production planning perspective, know that it's going to still be wrong. There will be changes, especially in gaming. You're pushing the envelope a lot in tech yeah, and in innovation. The market always is changing every few months, it seems. Um, so... As you go through, expect that I know that some of these things are wrong. So instead of trying to spend so much time trying to figure out all those little things that are going to be wrong, I, I've seen over and over, it's best to spend your time on getting everything nice and uniform, get alignment on expectations that there are, these are the things that we don't know and we're not going to until we get through and we start going through production. And that's okay. So let's not freak out about those things. But as a production, instead of trying to plan and figure out what all of those things are going to be, it's better to spend the time wrapping around, um, okay, when we, when we know that these things are going to be issues because we don't know, here are the ways that we can help mitigate when that, those things happen. Having a good understanding of when do we regroup as a, as a team and say, make a decision on certain things later on. Um, having some type of procedure within you, you know your team or organization that says okay who's who's expected to shepherd this and understand and try and figure out um, these unknowns as we go really just setting that stage of accepting that you you are not going to know all those things and that's okay so let's not waste all of our time and energy trying to at up front figure all of those things out on this creative living breathing thing let's instead spend the time setting up our foundation so that we have a good productive uh iterative in um production schedule and and time and then just set some parameters for when these things do go wrong because they will uh how do you address those so that you're not scrambling um at the last minute when that stuff happens that would be, I think, one of the first major ones that I've seen over and over and over again. You know, and, and I have a follow-up question on that. I mean, so if you think about the creative leaders versus the business leaders, um, I mean, the creative leaders, I guess, like what you're saying here, and and the, maybe you know the business leaders would be like, well, you know, what's the you know what do we have at this particular deadline, right? So, so how do you handle, you know, the whole uh, business leader situation? Um, a lot of that, so 
from that perspective, it's aligning on not necessarily um, the exact, um, how do I say, um, this is exactly what's going to happen every week or every month. Um, back up a little bit and come to an alignment on, all right, here are the things that are important for the business to show progression. And here are the things along those uh, and, and pivot points, I, I like to call them, of when we're going to get together and evaluate how the project is going. You know, a lot of companies call them like phase gates or, um, you know, or project maturity phases, whatever you want to call them. But something a little bit higher level than like a sprint or necessarily even a release where you're saying as a business, we know we have to meet E3 to get to a demo here, or we have some business partners or investors that we have to showcase X, Y, and Z and make sure that along the way, we're doing the checkpoints against progression to those major points, not necessarily, well, I didn't see this feature and this was supposed to be in this week, but it looks like that's progressing to next week. That's more for the internal team to sort of figure out. So you want to have the business understand that it's not about the those little checkpoints along the way because that's that's going to go awry. It, it just is, um, and that's okay, as long as you have procedures in place from a production perspective to understand when those things are happening, and then understands okay, well, how do we overcome that now? Is that okay? Do we continue down that road and maybe change the scope? Do we change the design a bit, um, or you know, in some cases it's happened where it's like, well, you know what, this just, we gave it our best shot. We're here. Let's cut our losses. This isn't going to work out. Maybe there's market conditions that are different or have changed. So from a business perspective, we just want to make sure, you know, on a major, more higher level milestone basis that those deliverables are more than just, okay, we're out of pre-pro. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean a lot uh, to a business. It's really great terminology from a production perspective and it makes good articles and and things like that but you really need to define that as a business and align on really what does that mean for you uh, what does the end of pre-pro mean for your business what do you need to see what do you need to demonstrate and after you get past the original one i always go back to the build doesn't lie so it should be evaluating the build. It should be seeing the deliverables, not just going off of the schedule. Uh, you can't ship a schedule at the end of the day. Uh, you know, as much as a lot of producers would love to, uh, you, you can't ship that. You know, I, I, I know you are working with lower companies that are, you know, venture backed. Uh -huh. So, and you were saying like the build doesn't lie. I love that. Um, do, do you find that investors are buying into that? You know, they, they see the build, you love it or not, or, you know. Um, working with the investment community is a little bit different because uh, it really depends on what your relationship is with them. So there are some investors that uh, are very hands-on and really you know, want to get into the mix of everything, in which case that really is you want to get the build in their hands so they can see the progression. But you also want to do it in a way where they understand what they're seeing. So anyone that's been in game development, especially on large titles, at the beginning, when you start seeing things come in, if you don't know or you haven't been in games, you could start freaking out. Like, why are these boxes moving around? This isn't this isn't a game. I don't understand what this is. But from the game perspective, you're looking it's like, perfect. That's exactly where we want to be because you're you're trying to prove out certain things over production, right? And it takes time to get assets in. And assets usually come in later than 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 the than um, the other elements. So a lot of that is alignment with the investors, making sure that uh, you know if you have a very close relationship, explaining to them if they're not used to game development, how that relates. Uh, a lot of other investors are a little bit more hands off, and they just want to see those major high level you know deliverables met. Um, focus groups and have other people that are more independent evaluate the build and, and uh, give information back about it being on track. But it's a little bit more of a, I'll say, more of an arm's length relationship than your internal business uh, stakeholders. 
So the companies that you work with, I mean, how do you handle that? I mean, if you have investors that are maybe not so used to investing in games, mm-hmm. how, how do you make sure that you get like the right arm's length with that? That's, uh, <clears throat> well, every investor is a little different, but um, in my, I'll say more limited experience with a lot of the, the venture back side versus the internal business perspective, um, a lot of that is really setting expectations and understanding what they're looking for, which is, which is really the same thing I would say at every level of stakeholder in the organization. It's what is it that you want to see or you need to see or are expecting to see really um, throughout production for you to verify that we're on track or we're not, or it's going according to plan. And what I like to do is just ask the question, and see how they answer it. And a lot of times you can tell um, some based on language that is being used or terminology, you know, if they really know what they're looking at, if they've been in the industry for a while, um, or if they're a little bit more newer, uh, you know, to being exposed to gaming production. And if they're a little bit newer, to that, I like to just sort of sit back and sort of explain at a high level what the expect what the expectation is to see over time, and how the game will evolve. and And one of the big things is I like to explain here are the most likely the problems that we're going to have that we can't solve right now, and we can't solve it because we don't know because there's some things that we need to see. We need to get it into the hands of people. We need to see the emotion that it invokes how immersive things are. For example, some are like, I need to know what type of soundtracks and music licensing you're going to do before I even have a game. And that's hard because it's the music also is supposed to be, you know, um, complementary to a lot of the experience. So it's sort of like saying, and what I actually have used in the past few weeks actually is saying, well, that's sort of like saying, tell me all the soundtracks you're going to have to this horror film before you even film the horror film. It's really, you you really can't do that. A lot of it is you need to do things in sync with each other because each element um, from, especially from a senses perspective, the visual and the audio, they need to really uh, be very symbiotic and work very well together. Otherwise, like it's like watch a horror movie and put it on mute and tell me if you get the same, uh, you know, that same feeling that you would when you have it really loud with the, with the sound effects. So I'm going to ask you like a tough question. Are you ready? ready? Sure. Well, you know, you know, being both a game and film investor, um, you know, if the investor wants to invest in this like shiny, amazing, creative new company in the game industry, but you know, they want to make sure that, you know, this is going to be on track. You know, when I bring you in to make sure that this is, you know, managed in a good way. I mean, what would be your typical pitch, you know, to, to this investor? It's like, okay, this is how I can help. Um, that's a good question. I usually, this has actually been a realistic sim, uh, inv- um, question that actually I've had to experience in the past few weeks. Um, from like a due diligence perspective and understanding, you know, you know progression, uh, the first thing is uh, trying to say, well, let me come in and understand and gain some alignment to make sure that at least the people that are producing the games versus your expectations are, are aligned. S- high level things, schedule, quality, um, you know, it's very different saying, oh, I expect this to be a triple A title. Um, and it's going to sell 50 million units versus, oh, it's an indie game and we're, you know, we're only expect it's expected to maybe push a few thousand units, but it's okay because we're using it as a promo for a movie, you know, whatever it may be. So the first thing is I, I always say sort of, I'm, I'm sort of that translator and that connective tissue to make sure that at least those two things are in sync first. Second, uh, then second, we take a look and say, well, what are the expectations of delivery and progress and make sure that those things are aligned and those are accounted for on the game production perspective. 
Um, and then we'll really start getting into a little bit more in the weeds of trying to see, okay, well, is the team really working in like this iterative fashion or do they think that they know every single thing um, about it? And in my history and experience, teams that sort of say, no, this is exactly what's going to happen, almost always run into, run into troubles and, and problems. And when they experience those issues that inevitably will come up, they have a harder time adjusting to that because now it comes across as we're wrong and as opposed to we expected that we were going to be wrong. And those are two very different things, which is why I was saying like the number one thing is just know that it's wrong, uh, but have some parameters around it and have those guide rails. The biggest analogy that uh, I think I, I've used with this in the past is if I've driven up a mountain uh, in a car hundreds and hundreds of times um, and I'm someone else is now going to drive their car up that mountain and it's really hard drive I need to be okay with them scraping the side of the car denting it a little bit and letting them experience some of those failures because that's the best way to learn a lot of those but I'm not okay with them driving over a cliff so as far as my intervention level um, I sort of put it that way and say I will protect you from driving over the cliff I'll pull the cord to say stop and and push but I if there's someone that comes in and is dictating, this is exactly what you need to do on a daily basis, that seldom never works because the team has its own culture. Um, and it that itself is its own living, breathing thing as well itself. And the best way for sometimes for them to learn and gain that experience is to dent the car and, and scratch it. So those parameters are those things that I try and look at and get in sync between the business side investor side and the team of saying, are you, are you okay with the team scratching the car? No, we're not okay with that. Okay. Are you okay with them getting a flat tire? Okay. We are okay with that. So, you know, excuse the analogies, but that's the best way I can explain really trying to understand where those two sides are coming from. Because again, in my experience, that's usually almost always the source of contention midway to the end of project. Uh, when someone says, oh, I delivered this, this is alpha, which that means something completely different to almost every studio I've worked in. Uh, but it's like, okay, this is an, this is an alpha state. And then someone looks and goes, that's not alpha state at all. I expected it to be completely done bug free, but that's not what we define it as. And now you're in this really odd situation uh, where you can't go back and change the things that you did. So now there's some source of contention where some, some party might feel like you're not living up to your end of the bargain or vice versa. And it creates, it starts to create some uh, tension and, and anxiety. And that's never really good for, especially for these types of projects. So, um, it all comes back to that alignment. And when I engage on these projects, the biggest thing that I, I really stress is that I'm really there to ensure that there's alignment between the expectations of both parties. And then once that's there, really working through what, uh, how do we, are we on track for those expectations? And are we planning for the unexpected? Because one of the, one of my, one of those five or however many points, you know, it, it, it may be was make sure that you're scheduling unscheduled time right? Time boxing certain things. A lot of games don't fully come together until the end in polish. Um, during midway through production, having time to shore up the stability. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can't schedule day by day, hour by hour, um, even week by week. Some of it is you need to give people some freedom, but you can time box it. Sort of like the, uh, the adage, art is never done. Um, when, you know, when you work, you know, when, if I, every artist I've ever worked with, I said, Hey, is it done? They, I've never gotten a, yeah, it's done because it's a personal thing. They, you know, if they had their way, they go on forever and make it, you know, perfect. And only one more week, just one more week. It's almost there. Um, so, you know, those are the things like, but you can get around that by giving people say, okay, I, by Friday, what is, what does done look like, you know, and then manage to that. 
as opposed to the other way around. Um, so super cool. I mean, I have I have a question. So um, I think some of the things you know in terms of assumptions uh, that you're hinting at comes with experience. But let's say that you're a junior producer. You know, you're coming in as like a you know like a associate or assistant producer. Um, you know, you don't have the experience that you have. I mean, you know, what would be like the first and very important things to master uh, to get like a good start? I'll speak for myself when, you know, when I started. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that I'm uncommon in this aspect. I There's some comfort, especially on the production side, project management side. Um, there's comfort in numbers, right? Uh, when you see something in a schedule and it's organized, you're like, okay, we're great now because look how organized this is. I've calculated out to the hundredth decimal place, you know, whatever. So how could it go wrong? Uh, and I cling to that too, because it's a comfortable feeling, you know, you're like, okay, I can't control the creative, but I can control this. Realize that you're not controlling anything. Um, it, and it's sort of a false sense of security step back and look at things at a little bit higher level along the approach and say, forget about the specifics of the schedule. What's the environment that you're creating around this production? Are you allowing for this iteration to happen? And then at each iteration point, really think of it as an experiment, right? It's all science. Agile sort of in a way feel always feels like a very big science experiment to me in general, where if you're running a science experiment, you're not, you're saying at the end of this, I expect this is going to happen. Well, that's your hypothesis. Well, as a scientist, what you want to make sure happens so that you get valid results is to make sure that the process that you're going through to test those, th those conditions or uh, the production environment that you're in are repeatable and strong. So instead of focusing so much on the individual pieces of the schedule, take a step back and look at the environment that you're setting up. How long are your iterations? Do people understand what they do at the beginning of the iteration, what they're expected to do at the end? Do they understand what their roles are? Um, at what point do you say stop because something's you know completely going awry? When you get all those conditions around this experiment, right, a failure is actually a positive result because you know that the conditions around it are sound and the expectation that you delivered was not there. Well, that's a valid result. So it's like, okay, well, we didn't get what we thought we were going to. Great. At that point, you know that there's a disconnect. The team can come back and then you need to rediscuss like, okay, well, uh, what should we change? Should we adjust expectations on what the next thing is? Does the game design need to change? Each of those points then at the end of that experiment um, is really a means of having a full conversation and understanding what are the things that we need to change to make things better. And I think more on the junior side, that's very uncomfortable. At least it was for me because it feels loose right? It doesn't, it, it, I don't feel like I can control that. And like traditional project management, especially like in college, and it's all about control. It's all about, you know, your numbers, you know, that when tasks move and dependency management and all of that stuff. So when we're moving into this way, we're saying, yes, that's important, but what's more important is the parameters of what you're doing. And understanding what your what your result is that you're expecting in a short term and then validating those results and then making changes and adjustments along the way um, so that's the whole embrace the failure aspect right it's not that oh my oh my gosh this the the game is a complete failure it's it's about saying okay well we tried this we thought this was going to happen we didn't get that result you need to adjust don't continue to do the same thing right? The whole definition of insanity and expect that all of a sudden something's going to change. Typically it does not, right? You're just going to keep reap, uh, reaping those failures. So really treat each opportunity when you're done at that experiment time to really have 
a really transparent and honest conversation about is it our expectations that were wrong? Um, is it there's something wrong in the tech? Did the market change? Should we adjust? And that's the whole like that's the whole point to I think any great game experience as it comes out um, because it, it is this creative projects are this living breathing thing and you you can't um, you can't just have this checklist at the end say yes we did this we did this we did this boom we're going to be successful um, or it's going to be fun that's very subjective it's an emotional response and you're not going to really know that until you get things in a, in a build and you get people starting to play it and that's why I always say it's like you can't plan someone's feeling you know, or emotion you, but what you can do is you can plan that if they have this type of emotion or this isn't working, here's what we think we can do. Here's our pivot point. If we have this happen, here are some things I think we can do. And then as you go through production, at least you have, um, you know, some counter strategies that you can pivot to as you go through and you don't, and you're not caught flat footed. So let me try a very, um, uh, controversial statement here with you. You ready? Sure. <laughs> so, um, would you agree that um, productions could be done in half of the time uh, from what it was, you know, scheduled to be? To have like something out there that you can iterate on. I think it depends on the what it was scheduled to be part, um, but. Okay, so th let me refine that. So I'm not talking about uh, like AAA uh, story driven. I'm thinking more like uh, live ups. Um, so uh, something playable. You start having feedback from the market. Yeah, I. So especially more, yeah, more in the past several years. Um, you know, when I started again dating myself, that was almost impossible to do because things, you know. You, put out the disc and then you sort of hope that things are going to go well. Um, especially more so, you know, you have platforms like Roblox and um, a lot of other creation platforms that make it more accessible for other people to experience things. People necessarily aren't expecting perfection if you if you explain what you're doing correctly. It's like, you know, Steam with early access. Um, titles are pretty popular. People are willing to accept that if they understand and it's framed up front what they're getting into. And for the most part, a lot of people like to be along the way and included uh, within that development. So I think it's very dangerous, or I know it's very dangerous to, to say, this is where we're going to be and we're going to go dark for a long time until the end or, or sometime till the end. Um, that's sort of a long time and it's sort of, and it's a pretty big bet. Right. Uh, so with, uh, a lot of the titles, especially, I think, especially the larger ones, just cause they take a lot more time. Uh, it's, I've always tried, especially recently in the past few years, it's like, what is the first minimum thing? And I'm not talking about like MVP type of definitions, but what is the, fastest thing that we can do to get something in someone's hands. And it might be just an internal person. It doesn't need to be uh, like external closed beta access or something like that. The sooner you can get something in a build in someone's hand, the sooner you can start seeing if you're on track and you're connecting with that person. Um, there was the, there was someone a while ago that, that had mentioned something to me and ma made a statement that I, you know, that was pretty profound at least for me that I keep going back to is that listen to the game. The game will tell you what it wants to be. And I know it sort of sounds like, uh, like the you know, sort of out there, but if, if you really think about that, it, it, it's really saying, get people to experience what you're building, set the context up front. Like, Hey, there, these are placeholder player models. You're not going to see that. But what I'm trying to see is, is this part fun? Is this part fun? And get that as frequently as you can, because the more engagement that you have with that, you you may find that the core gameplay dynamic or um, or mechanic that you are planning on 
may not be the thing that you end up with. I've been on several projects where as we're going through um, like sort of early and midway, we find people playing a certain mechanic that just sort of came ancillary to some other things that we were doing and people responded well to that other thing than the thing that we planned on. So we scrapped the the main mechanic and moved it to the other one. That's the game telling you what's what what it wants to be and what that soul of that thing is. So you need to be open to listening to that. And the way to do that is not the people that are in the uh, you know in the mix programming and and doing all the art for it every day because they're going to be very biased. It's getting other people to give you open and honest feedback of how they're feeling. Are they connected to it? You know, is it, is this something that, Hey, this should be fun by now. Um, because if it's not, we're building everything on top of this mechanic. Now we're going to spend thousands of dollars on assets to build this thing out. And you really want to make sure that that foundation is strong because if it's not making it prettier is not going to do anything for you. So having that stuff earlier is useful. Would I agree that it can be done in half the time? I don't, I don't know if I'm going to go on record saying that because that's very specific, but I, I will say that I think a lot of the games that I've been a part of, um, with the, if we were able to adjust some company policy, uh, like I would have gone out sooner with some context and some pretext for, Hey, we want your opinion on these things. Okay. So I have a, I have a double question. Are you ready? This is the final one. Mm-hmm. Is this controversial too? Uh, you know, the first one was controversial. Now I'm going to go even more controversial. So, um, well, let me put it this way. I'm going to make it easy for you. Um, if an investor were asking you uh, to help with a portfolio company, um, what w- would your like analysis process be like? Like, okay, this is what I want to check out before I know before you have an opinion. Usually, I try and take a look at, from a portfolio perspective, right? So, usually, I'm uh, I try and take a look at what is their business model of what they're trying to go after first, to just to understand, and then um, assuming that they've had things already in production um, or released to market, uh, take a look at you know, the consumer response, what the feeling is to the brand, um, you know, sort of what the engagement looks like to sort of understand not only where is that company expecting like to want to be or want to be seen as, uh, in the market versus where are they actually being judged by their actual consumers? Uh, that's sort of the first place I'd try and take a look just so I can understand the context of the environment, you know, that, that we're working within just to, you know, really just to ensure that, um, is there a disconnect there? Because if there is the very first conversation is, do you want to, if you think that you're this, um, really fun, casual games company that has a portfolio of a whole bunch of games and nobody seems to be having fun doing it because they're expecting something else or the market has changed. That's a very different conversation now to have um, because that goes above and beyond auditing projects. That's more of, okay, well, the alignment of what you want to be versus where you are in reality is, you know, is a, is disconnected. So is, is it, you want to change your brand? Is it that you want to change the outlook um, on what you're known for? And if, or is it you, you still want to be known for this, but you haven't been able to execute on that vision because those are two very different engagements. So I'll typically start there. So I have a, have an extreme tough question. You haven't said anything's easy yet. Come on. This is why you're on the podcast. <laughs> so, you know, okay. So here, here it comes, you know, and, and I, I know we're over time. So, you know, I'm gonna, you know, it is what it is now. When we talk about production, you know, because when we talk about how to make production better uh, in in studios that are venture funded or studios that are publisher owned, um, you know, what is the question I have not asked that I should ask? Um, for venture backed? Any of them? 
A- any anything? Um, I think probably the the question that I've heard the most is, what do I need to do to make sure that this game is successful in the market? Um, it's probably the most common question that I've heard. And unfortunately, the answer isn't always what uh, investors want to hear, which is, well, you can do everything right, every single thing in game production, and you still have maybe a 50-50 you know, chance of being successful in the market because the market is based on fun and fun is subjective, right? Uh, we're also in a in a world and a sort of a an environment where one person's tweet can change the effect of the entire company or the the success of that franchise. So while you can pay people to you know to to do that media for you, people see through that. Um, you know, it's it's really when you have the genuine reactions from people that do something organically. Uh, that you've seen some of those things really change the course of a product like among us is, you know, one of those that comes to mind. That's very similar to that. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that's probably the question I would expect to hear. And the answer to that is the thing that you can do is while you can't guarantee success, what you can do is you can ensure that, um, you've set the groundwork and the framework to at least reduce as many risks as possible. That's really all you can do. Um, is it the right idea at the right time? Uh, you know, you can evaluate that. You can see, you know, are these things selling in the market? Are people interested in this? What are the culture trends? A lot of that is, you know, business research up front. Uh, but from a production perspective, for me, um, it's making sure that there are you have a lot of outs and a lot of pivot points. I've seen some plans uh, recently where they're very specific. And my question to them was always, okay, I think this works for this current environment, but this production is a year and a half long. What happens if this happens? And you, you'll get silence and I say that the answer to that can't be silence. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that we have ways to pivot if things change during production. Otherwise, once we start, we're on a course, regardless of what happens in the environment or the market, if we're in a recession or, you know, or, or whatever it may be. So, uh, for me, when we start planning, especially from a production perspective, I like to take a look at it from two sides, the business side of saying, okay, well, it is this a very specific business case for this product that we're making? Um, very specific target market, you know, based on, you know, some current trends and market trends. So if those things go away, our chance of success in the market drastically decreases. If that's the case, I try and work with companies to try and evaluate how do we change or add to the uh, the business model. Maybe we make it more of a platform instead of a game. Maybe we add some different features, maybe, you know, whatever it may be. Um, from the internal perspective, I think it goes to a lot of things that I was talking about before, which is just ensure that you, you can plan that you can say, look, let's expect that there are market conditions that change when they do. Um, here's what our procedure is going to be to do some reevaluation. Um, and if you plan for those types of things, uh, uh, you know, and then you have the conversation from the business perspective, as far as this is how we can also pivot from a product idea or from a business case, you're setting yourself up to be able to really adjust with the market as it goes along, as opposed to being something very specific. And you're really hoping that this, 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 and this all come to fruition or stay the same um, for this to even be a chance of being successful. Cool. It was like, it was great talking with you as always. Yeah, same here. Um, and um, I know you're working with a lot of really cool companies. So, uh, you know, some of them using favorable, some not, you know, and I'm looking forward to more collaboration in the future. 
Absolutely. Same here, Patrick. And thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, right. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, you know what to do. Share it in your social media so more people can take part and learn. And one more thing. Check out Favro Academy on favro.com for many more learnings. Thanks for tuning in.